Don't you turn that station, don't you turn that dial, because if you do, if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. Because our guest this evening is Ted, Dabrow Ted Dabrowski. He, of course, is VP Planning at the Illinois Policy Institute. That's the major think tank in the state of Illinois. To be fair, major conservative think tank along with the Heartland Institute, okay, sounds right, Heartland Institute, Illinois Policy Institute, two both very free market, liberty, oriented, I think that'd be fair to say, free market, liberty, libertarian Sounds oriented good. think tanks, okay? Any case, if you're sitting there and you wonder what's wrong with Illinois? Is it, is it a state that it's high in unemployment, tough to get jobs? Is it a state where pension reform or pen, state employee pensions are out of control and the state is facing massive problems, that pen, those pensions are crowding out spending? Is it a state in which education is just really not performing? In the Chicago public schools, for example, only one out of every five black kids in fourth grade reads at grade level. Shouldn't we do something about all of those? Shouldn't all of those problems be fixed with education, with state employee pensions, with jobs? You're going to find out the answers to those and, and some more questions from Ted Dabrowski of the Illinois Policy, Illinois Policy Institute. Don't turn that station. Don't turn that dial. Because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name and politics is our game. And we are going to be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because we have the guy who is some, his name is synonymous with policy. In fact, Ted Dabrowski is the vice president of policy at the Illinois Policy Institute. But what does that mean? That means if you're watching the show and you're fed up with the Chicago public schools and you say, okay, your kid's not at one of the elite schools, not at one of the select enrollment schools, not at Walter, Walter Payton, Jones Prep, so forth. Your kids at a neighborhood school were only one out of every five, one out of every five black kids in the fourth grade reads at grade level. Is there any reason why you should wait any longer? Chicago public schools started reform under Mayor Richard M. Daley in 1995. 18 years later, 18 years later, Ted Dabrowski, is there any improvement? You know, there's so many schools that continue to fail. You take a school like Fenger High School, which we've Answer heard so my much question. about. Is there any improvement in 18 uh, years? You know, there might be some improvement, and there's pockets of improvement, and we've certainly got some great... But um, it's negligible. But hang on, but magnet schools and things yeah. like that. But when you take, you take the average, it's not so good. But I'd, I'd like us to talk a little bit about the worst of those schools. If okay. you take the bottom 10%, those are some really dire, dire schools, and those kids that come out of there will not have a chance. And where do people find out? Because your, your institute, the Illinois Policy Institute, has written something right and posted something on your website where do they find out about that so on illinoispolicy.org okay. on our website and, and there what do they look a, for how do they there find we've out? got an education section okay. and in there we've done a recent report on on the, the worst performing schools in chicago and the story that it tells is really sad because as you mentioned you've got kids who, who are finishing school in chicago juniors who can't do the can't calculate an average for example if there's five okay. test scores they cannot calculate that average uh, if you give them uh, there's about a large chunk of them who, if you ask them to, the plot of a story, they can't find it in a, in a, in a paragraph. What percent of them could read at fourth grade level or sixth grade oh, level? Oh, yeah, it's, it, so, so, right. In the, in the if we were to go to a fourth grade class, would we find only you, one out of five on you, average right, you'd could have, read at yeah, grade you'd level? You'd have 20%, right, and you'd 20%. find that, that 20 to 25% right, yes. can't find that plot or that well, 20 to 20, characters. 20 to 20% can and 80% can't, isn't no, that no, probably? 20, 20 can't. Uh, okay. And if you look but at but no for reading for reading if we went to fourth grade and right. we looked at their tests CPS tests, what we'll find according to the people who've looked at this from CPS as well as elsewhere, the so and not I'm talking I'm not talking conservatives here I'm talking people across the board, will say that on average about 20 percent of the black kids enrolled in the fourth grade in the Chicago public schools read at grade level, 80 percent do not. Right. 
And so, and, and there's, you know, I tell you another amazing stat of, of and this is shocking when you look at it, but um, some numbers anywhere from five to 10% of kids when they're juniors are not, co or, sorry, only 5% of the worst schools are the kids college ready. That means that you're talking about 90 to 95% of kids are not ready for college, which means that they can't, they will be, they'll be stuck earning minimum wages, uh, not finding good jobs and reliant on government services. So the, the results of the Chicago schools and the Illinois schools is, is really quite, quite worrisome. Well, the ironic thing, and we'll get to that, get to that later in the show, you mentioned they'll be stuck in minimum wage jobs. They'll be lucky if they can get a minimum wage right. job because as we'll talk about, the minimum wage is a way of pricing kids with low skills out of the market. So it's bad enough that we didn't give these kids the skills they should have. It's we. It's the city of Chicago. It's Rahm Emanuel. It's Mayor, Ra Mayor Richard M. Day Daly. You can go back to Mitch Mayor Richard J. Daly. We didn't give these kids the skills. We didn't teach them how to read. It's not a matter. When I say black kids, it would be very similar for Hispanic kids. 85% of the kids in CPS are minority. That's right. So if there are 10 or 15% of these kids from relatively high income areas in select enrollment schools, they're, yeah, they're not screwing up their education, but they're not addressing what admittedly are difficult problems, but they should be figuring out, okay, then they go to get a job. Well, the minimum wage prices them out of the market. Okay, we'll come back to that. No, minimum wage is not a good thing, Governor Pat Quinn. Come here and we'll debate it, okay? No, Bruce Rauner, you had it right first when you said the minimum wage should be lowered, not increased. No, Kirk Dillard, you had it right first when you said the minimum wage is not a good solution, and now you jump over on Rauner. We need people like Ted Dabrowski and John Tillman from the Illinois Policy Institute. We know Joe Bast and others from the Heartland Institute to speak truth to power. Don't be politically expedient. Be like these guys. So if we jump ahead, okay, we've talked a little bit about education. What is the solution? What is a systemic solution? Well, the systemic solution is to give families choice. Uh, what we need is a, a, a market of competition where there's all kinds of different schools opening up. Uh, a parent and a child get to look and see what is the best school for that, the way that child learns for the type of uh, subjects or, or methods of teaching that, that a family wants. And you know, families should be, should be free to choose just like they do for any other, uh, any other product that they buy. Uh, unfortunately, sure, because that's, that's, so we, just a brief thing, we got that here, I'll hold that up so people can see, Free to Choose by Milton and Rose Friedman. You read that book? I've read parts of it, I've never read the whole thing fully. Because you studied at the University of Chicago Harris School. Correct. You're a guy who's accomplished, who is out in business, who is making it, so to speak, more money than God. Well, maybe not that, but quite a bit. But you decided you wanted additional satisfaction. You wanted to come back and deal with public policy issues. And part of your preparation was to go to one of the great institutions, University of Chicago That's right. and the Harris School, right? That's correct. And you focused on public policy. Correct. And so you're familiar with free to choose because you believe in competition. Part of that did you get at the, did you learn about that at the Harris School? Well, we learned about that at the Harris School. Uh, unfortunately, I would say that one of the issues with the Harris School is that they, they focus a lot on where the free markets break down and they say that the government needs to step in. What do we call and fix that? Things. What do they call that at Harris School when they say? Well, they call it the failure of the free markets. And not just there; they do it at Harvard, they do it at Princeton, they do it at Yale. The one thing some of us learned at the University of Chicago, if you go across the street to the Economics Department, when Milton Friedman was there, and George Stigler and the Greats, they would say, "Yes, there are some instances of market failure, free market failure. They're very few, but the comparison is: does the government do better, or does the government fail?" So the CPS would be an example of? Of government failure. Government failure. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, how, how, how we ended up with a system where I think we all agree, many of us agree, that, that all children should have access to funding for, for a public education or right. an education. To funding. To funding education. So like Some, a school voucher or school of choice. Right. They, right? Should, they should have access to the money so that the family can then What does that purchase. mean, a school of voucher or school of choice? That means a, a, a family would receive an amount of money an equivalent amount of money that allows them to purchase an education from a different provider. Unfortunately, at some point, we, we said that the government is going to be not only the funder, but the provider and the deliverer of education. Almost, almost uh, the sole provider, not the not case. Sometimes we talk about single payer in healthcare. They're going to be the single buyer monopsony. Well, but we almost make the local schools the single provider. We do have some private school choice, private school competition, but but Jeff, in large it, but part, it's, a, it's a single provider unless yeah. you unless you're wealthy. 
right? Right. So un if, you're, if you're low income, a middle class or low, a working class, and you don't have the resources to go to a private school, or if you're not lucky enough to win uh, acceptance into a, a lottery for a charter school, or, or you, you can't move out of, out to the suburbs. Or if your kids are doing well, they can test into it's a, a select enrollment school. That's right. Walter Payton would be a select enrollment school. Correct. Okay. So not then, char the charter schools are not select enrollment schools, right? That's right. They're they're open enrollment for the most but, part. For the most part, but for the most part, the schools I mentioned, like Walter Payton, they're for the elite kids. They're for not uh, not simply elite. They're for kids who do well on tests, do well on grades, which happen to be in many cases kids of higher income parents, it's convenient for them, to parents to stay in the city, and Daly, Richard M. Daly, thought of this, well, let's have a place for them so they don't have to flee the city, and the only way we can do it is set up these select enrollment schools. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, so those people, those people have the choice. They can you know, go to these good schools, and if they can't get their kids into those schools, they can stay in the city and send their kid to a private school. Correct. But the low-income parent, and we spend about, we've got 400,000 kids in the Chicago public schools, six, almost a $6 billion budget. It's about 15,000 per kid per year, right? Nobody says that, but that's the truth. That's right. That's so correct. do we do what you said? Do we take the so, 15,000 and give it to the low-income parent and say, you can stay in the public school, but if you don't want to, you can take that 15,000 and go to private and school. And that's do what we, we do don't that? do. That's what we, we don't, don't do. do. What we do is we give all the money to, to bureaucracy and then they dish the money around in the way that they see fit. Now, they've made some reforms about money following the child, some improvements, but in the end, uh, what, it, what needs to be done is that the families need to be able to have that money. Because if not, what we've got is we've got a monopoly. And if you think about market failure, they talk a lot about market failure, free market failure, it's when there's monopolies. Right. And now we've and that created- And you and the Harris School and everybody agrees, monopoly is not good, right? That's right, but yes. But the issue is, is that we've created a monopoly, a government provider uh, called Chicago Public Schools. They're, they're the monopoly of providing school. And then on the other side, you've got the monopoly of teachers because you've got the teachers union and they're the monopoly provider of teachers. And those two groups fight each other a lot, but they also work together. And they work together, unfortunately, not in the best interest of children. Right. I mean, some competition seeps through because Rahm Emanuel, and look, sometimes I've been critical of Rahm because he clearly doesn't, Rahm came on this show in 2002 when he was running for Congress and he said he was virulently against school vouchers, but he was for charter schools. And true to form, he's kept that, and he's now in the current. We're taping this show on June, January 14th, 2014, and Rom and his school board, and he appointed these folks, are getting criticized because they now want, they expanded, I think, 15 new charter schools in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. They want to get on the school board meeting scheduled for January 22nd, 2014, and if this isn't airing on cable, we hope it's at least posted by then. So people should know they should go to that school board meeting on January 22nd, because up for approval will be 22 charter schools, I believe, right? Um, I think around that number. And who's that lady from, from uh, Raise Your Hand, Wendy? Who's that lady? I think we have that article here. Bennett, I think it is. What? Here, we got that here. We just, because, um, because uh, Wendy Catton, so Wendy Catton has sent something, this was in Cranes, right? Is, or also in the Chicago Tribune? Mm -hmm. Somewhere, appeared there. So Wendy Catton is involved with Raise Your Hand, and she's very much against charter schools. You mm -hmm. seen that article? Yes, I have. Why do you suppose Wendy would be against charter schools? Because you said parents want that, it gives competition, it gives school choice. Wendy's against that choice, well, why Wendy, do you suppose? Wendy said that there's already enough choice in the public school system. Already enough. Already enough choice. So that parent of that fourth grade kid who's got only a one in five chance of learning how to read, Wendy says, it's good enough. What, you want better than one in five? Well, I think, you know, I think it's very- And by the way, in case you think, we're, if we were misrepresenting Wendy's point of view, Wendy, you've got a standing invitation to come on public affairs by yourself anytime, and we'll discuss and debate, because unlike some programs, we try to be balanced. We can't always have balance enough people here to do it, but one by one, all points of view get heard on public affairs. Right, so you know, her argument is that there's already enough choice, there's already enough magnets, there's already enough charters. Um, but, but the point she's missing is that you know, it's not everybody can get into the magnets. Not everybody can get into the charters. Um, there's a waiting many, list. Many, there's what, waiting list for waiting list. I can't remember the number now, but there's a, a big waiting list. But approximately list. how many kids are in charter schools About 12% of all Chicago. So about 50,000 students That's right. of the 400,000. That's correct. So, and right now, without the additional expansion that Rom is asking for, 
You've got maybe 100,000 who want, maybe more who want to be in the 50,000, but only 50,000 slots. Wendy says, enough. You folks, if you don't get in, what's she say, tough? Just, we've, we've got enough choice. We have enough but choice. But I, th I think the big argument that I would make, and, you know, and this is what I would ask Wendy to do, uh, the study we looked at, at the 20, at the 10 percent worst schools in Chicago, the results are horrible. Those kids will not, uh, well, will struggle. I can't say that not every kid won't perform. Some kids will make it, but the majority of kids will not uh, be successful uh, contributing m citizens. They're going to struggle. And I would love for Wendy to go to those par the parents of those children who are going to places like Finger and some of these schools that have failed for, for 10, 15 years. Talk with those parents. Talk with those parents and say, you've got enough choice. You need to go to that school. Continue to go to that school. I'm sorry, you, you know, too bad. And these parents are often, not always, African American, Hispanic, minority. Mm -hmm. Is it sort of doubly insulting that you would go to minority parent and say, in large part, the kids going to select enrollment schools are white, and they get the choice out of these failing schools. But you folks, you just happen to be black, happen to be Hispanic. It's not really personal, but you don't have the choice. If we did that in anything else, wouldn't the Justice Department sue? Because if, not, if our motive was not to be racial, mm -hmm. our effect would be, wouldn't it? We're basically not going to the rich white kids and saying, you got to stay there. We're going to the poor black kids, poor Hispanic kids. Don't you think Barack Obama's Justice Department, they should sue the CPS, right? No, I think, I think it's, it's the big moral issue. Um, you know, I think if they don't do it, if they don't decide on January 22nd to radically expand charter schools. I mean, Rom, you've been there two years. If you really were true to your word and you said you wanted to focus on fixing education, you should have had by now 50,000 more charter school students, don't you think? Absolutely, I, 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 yeah. I agree. Now, the thing, the interesting thing about charters too is that you know she talks that there's already uh, lots of charters, but uh, charter schools are also public schools, and so she right. should be for additional public schools because she, they are. But she says, a, and maybe a source of competition. This. But let, let me just make well, one point. Yeah. Just one point on the charters, and you should know that the charters that are in Chicago, uh, many of them look exactly like from from a demographic perspective, just like the public schools, eighty something percent black, you know. 10% uh, Latino, et cetera, so similar numbers. And um, if you look at the top 10 charter schools in Chicago, sorry, the top 10 open enrollment schools in Chicago. Open enrollment. Open enrollment, they are charters. They're all they charters. They outperform all charters. Outperform. They outperform the So charters school. in general, and you could put sites to other studies, but looking at just the CPS, CPS statistics, you're saying, you could show with their data that, and people have shown this, oh, this is, yeah. that they out, charter schools outperform traditional public schools. For open as long enrollment. as we make open, that's the comparison to make apples to apples. Correct. Open enrollment. We're not going to let the neighborhood schools that are used be the select enrollment schools because there the kids have to, we bring, screen out the kids whose test scores aren't high. Mm -hmm. With charter schools, with open enrollment neighborhood schools, no and remember, screening. And remember their lottery. There's a lottery right, for charter so, schools. So charter schools don't select the students. Right. It's a lottery. When there are more people who want to get in than they have slots, it's by lottery. Correct. Okay. And, so, par and parents and children opt into the school. Charters do not select their students. So I'm just wondering if Wendy were here, how huh, she would answer these things, why she wants to cut out the expansion of charter schools. Well, she says in her article, she says, well, look, it's not fair because these neighborhood schools that currently exist, the neighborhood open enrollment schools, the money for them has been taken out and they're going to charter schools and they're cutting out the arts programs, they're cutting out the PE programs, they're cutting out the special reading programs. They're spending less money on those open enrollment neighborhood schools and more money is going to charter schools. Do you know of any studies that's showing the charter schools are getting more money than the public schools? No, charter schools don't typically get more money. They, they make it less. get less. Because they have to provide their own capital costs, capital right? Capital cost, absolutely. Whenever they, they, somehow they have to do it like they go around begging and getting volunteers because they don't, but the public schools have their capital costs paid for by taxes, by Correct. everybody. Correct. So what could she mean? It would be so nice. Oh, Wendy Catton was on Chicago Tonight. That's a public TV station. You would think they would be balanced. So look for Chicago Tonight. I know. I'm on the community advisory board. I'm for Chicago Tonight. I'm for TTW, but I'm for balance. So if you go, it's either January 8th or January 9th. Only have to look at two days. They're all online. Watch the program. Carol Marine's there, and she's interviewing Wendy Catton. She said they tried to get people there from CPS or the Chicago Teachers Union. You couldn't or charter schools, but she couldn't. I mean, did she call you? Not that I know of. Did she call John, John Tillman from the Only Policy Institute? Not that I know of. I, I, you got like 20 other people there. It's a $4 million budget. You could scare up somebody to do it. 
the Heartland Institute. I think she called Joe back. No, I, I, think, you know, I think we'd appreciate the opportunity to, to engage in this. Absolutely. Because she has. To be fair, Carol has had John Tillman on before. Mm -hmm. But here was a show. It was focused on charter schools. Really this point. And you know, Carol gave the answer. It's so good that Carol would know this because she said she also had Stephen Tozer from the University of Illinois mm -hmm. Chicago campus and he's professor of education policy studies. Has he studied charter schools? Well, little I've seen, not really, okay? He writes on like performance, he's written an article on performance of teachers in alternative certification schools relative to other schools. But did he do, I haven't seen a study of charter schools by him. But he no. said, he said, look, charter schools are not a systemic solution. Why? Why do you suppose you think it's not a systemic solution? What, what did he say? He said because they're not all the same? Yeah, because, you know, you got charter schools that do this and charter schools that do that. So he says, of course, I'm paraphrasing, but of course you're not going to have everything done right and have them fixed. He said some charter schools will do well, his students, some are at those, they're teaching at those schools or principals, some won't. And then Carol filled in everything you need to know. She said, well, professor, she said, there are some good charter schools, and that's like the good neighborhood schools. There's some bad charter schools, and that's like the bad neighborhood schools. Pretty much the same, right? He said, yes. And so John Tillman was there to say, oh, but you got, oh, but John wasn't invited. Oh, Ted Dabrowski was there. Oh, but Ted wasn't, a, nobody. Oh, but Joe Bass. There was nobody there because they couldn't find anybody. You know how they used to, Carol, I hate to say this, but it used to be the point where, remember, they couldn't find where women were underrepresented, and they shouldn't have been. I'm a feminist. In law schools, they were discriminated against way back, okay? Med schools, they were discriminated. Jobs, they were discriminated. And you know what they used to say, Carol? We looked, but we couldn't find qualified people to participate in, these, in those schools. So I guess Carol looked, and she couldn't find anybody qualified to speak on behalf of charter schools. No, I don't think she looked. And Carol, we've asked you to be on the show, so if I've misrepresented anything you've done or that Chicago Tonight has done or TTW has done, come on the show. You'll have the full, we don't even bring somebody here from the Illinois Policy Institute. You can you say, Jeff, you got this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. Please come on the show, a standing invitation. But Jeff, I think the big thing about the charter schools, which, which Tozer gets absolutely wrong, is that that's the beauty of charter schools, is that they are different. That they bring a different approach on how to learn. Each school has a different. You want that. You want that. You want different. That's competition. how competition works. And also, differences. that's what consumers want. They want different things, right? They want a choice yeah. of, of different uh, products. Well, you have a smartphone. What's who makes your smartphone? I've got the Apple. You've got the Apple. I've got the Android. According to Carol and Tozer, no systemic solution. Let's go back to everybody having those phones like on your wall, and they're all the same. No, no, no. Don't have smartphone. Don't have different smartphones. You see, this is the problem with slight digression. Schools of Education teach this nonsense. Mr. Tozer, if I've misrepresented your views and you haven't had your first shot, for the next month we'll have Wendy Catton on, we'll have then Carol Marine on, we'll have Steve Tozer on. I'll take you on one by one and you'll each get a chance. For every word you use, I'll use a half a word. For every ten words you use, that, I'll that's, use two. that's a big promise right that's there, That's a Jeff. big promise. I, I, no, well, I, but I mean, what, am I getting this right, or would you phrase it differently? Now's your chance. I'm no, going to be no I think, you know, the, the, the Chicago Public Schools is, is as, as I said, a monopoly. It's a behemoth. It's, it's just massive. And I think, to Tozer's point, you end up getting, because of, of being a massive bureaucracy, you get a one-size-fits-all. That's not what people because we want. Because we want Androids, we want iPhones, we want all sorts of things. That's why we have smartphones, we have this competition that work. That's why we have computers that work. If 30 years ago, before we had personal computers, if somebody had said, the government's going to decide what's right, and according to Mr. Tozer, it'll all be the same. That'll be says, we didn't know what would be good. We actually, you and I don't know the best way to cure the problem in education, but we know free markets and competition will come well, up with the way, and I, right? And I also know that, that a, a parent, a mother, knows and wants what's best for her child. So parental we control. Have to, we have to let them have more say. Right. And we've taken okay. away the say of parents. And you know, we're, we're forcing kids, we're forcing kids to attend a school. You know, if they close down a school, we force them to go through a safe zone. Um, we force kids to go to some of the worst, most violent schools in, in, in the city. Uh, we're forcing kids to go to failed schools. It's time to open that up and end the current model. The current model doesn't work. And as, as you mentioned, you know, we've had some of these schools failing for 10 to 15 years. It's time. That can't go on. It's immoral. The fear of surgency of now, something like that Obama used to talk about, okay? Mm -hmm. It's now. The time, it's time for change, Barack. 2008 was supposed to be the time. It didn't happen. 2012 was supposed to be 
Is it time? It's time. It's time. Let's go on to state employee pension reform. Law passed. Mike, Speaker Mike Madigan says, now it's time. You guys can pass that. We'll do, edu we'll do state employee pension reform. They passed. The Chicago Tribune board, you know, Kristen McQuarrie was just here last week. People will see that. And she said, you know, yes, it wasn't quite what she would have done. She would like to see what you want, the only possible institute, to find contribution plans. Mm -hmm. But look, you couldn't have passed it, so let's take what we can get and get it done. Was Kristen McQuarrie wrong? I believe, she, I believe she's, she's wrong on that. And I think the biggest reason why is because what we did is we did what I would call a, a very much a partial reform, or maybe even a fake reform. And, and, and the reason I say that is, is because it takes huge capital to take on the unions and to reform pensions. And if you don't do it right the first time, we may not get a chance for five and 10 years. And the problem is, is that we didn't take, we didn't solve the problem enough. We hardly solved the problem. So things are likely to get worse over the next five to 10 years. And we'll, we may be in, even in a worse situation very soon. But you know, if you read what people said, they said a hundred billion dollars will be saved over the next uh, 20 or so 30 years. 160 billion over the next 30 years. Doesn't that solve our problem if we save all that money? No, it's not. So, Look at it in today's terms. The hundred billion is the big number. That's how much is missing from the from the accounts today. A hundred billion. We've reduced that hundred billion shortfall to eighty billion dollars at best. Now, the eighty billion dollars was the level of crisis we had in two thousand and eleven when we were all saying we're bankrupt. So all we've done is we've taken a very bankrupt system into a slightly less bankrupt, but and that's the problem we have. How do we do? How do we save that money? Tell us a little bit, just. One minute on what happened sure. as a result of the So we did some things that, that are in the right direction. We reduced the cost of living adjustments that okay. the retirees make. Um, we increased retirement ages somewhat. Okay. We um, put a cap on the pensionable earnings that people can, okay. can earn. Those are all good on. things. Those are all things that are in the right direction and certainly help. And COLA, the reduction in the cost of living adjustment is probably the major factor. That's the biggest factor. That's the we biggest lever. We won't go into details. Those are right. We raised it. We, we decreased the employee contribution, now this is, this which is goes in the wrong way. In the wrong but direction. the most important thing would be what? We just only have maybe a few minutes. So what is the worst thing that we did here? So we put in there a funding guarantee. And, and what funding that does, a funding guarantee means that pensions, the state pensions, will get funded before education, health care, you know, public safety, all those other things. The only thing we'll pay first are bonds, then pensions. So, and if they don't, the state employees on their own or through the public sector state employee unions can sue, right? Can sue, exactly. So the state, they were given the right to sue. Exactly. Just we need more citizens, not citizens in general, if you don't like the way things are working, if you don't think things are getting spent right, and if you're a large group of citizens, but you're not a state employee, you don't get to sue. No. No, so you've got this constitution. So you don't get, but the public and the state employees, which make about 3% of the population, they get to steer the budget for the other 97%. Right, and, and let me explain. This is, this is the other big problem. And look, teachers and state workers, they're not at fault for the, for the benefits they receive. They've negotiated a great deal with the legislators. Right. Um, so it's not their fault. But these, these benefits continue to be overly generous. So um, state workers can still retire in their 50s. Even after these reforms, they can still retire in their 50s. Uh, we're still paying cost of living adjustments to millionaires. So we actually didn't do the, enough of the reforms, and I think it's going to fall on the back of taxpayers. We only have like a minute left. What should we have done from the Illinois Policy Institute's well, perspective? What we need to do is we need to, to end let me just say, Let me just say, this is Ted Dabrowski, Vice President of the Illinois Policy Institute. If you don't find out all we don't have time, where do they go to find out more Illinoispolicy.org. In a minute or less, Illinois what should what should have been done to fix the state employee? Plans? Like the fundamental driver for, for getting real reform in Illinois and saving the state is going forward, moving to 401k style accounts, just like everybody has in the private Defined sector. contribution. Defined contribution. Um, not a defined benefit. Not a defined benefit. Those we can't manage, we can't afford, we just don't know how to do it. And co corporations have been getting out Can of it. Can you get that passed? You had GNEI supporting that. You had Tom Morrison, both state reps. Jim Oberweiss flipped. He wants to be a senator. He went mainstream. He only had two people. How no, do you we we we, you know, we had quite a few people talking about it. Talking about Everybody's it. talking. It's you know three and four years ago we didn't talk about it. Now we're talking about it. It's becoming so. In another few where years, you can get it passed in the Illinois legislature. We believe that you know with, with some change in leadership, with some potential change in, in, the, in the legislature, more and more people are going to come to realize that that's the solution. Are you guys